Well, good evening to everyone. We are grateful that you're joining us for Bible study this evening, whether you're doing it here in person or you're joining us online. We are continuing our study of the life of Jesus in this class. But before we dive into that, let's uh, go over some announcements and some health updates. Regarding announcements, we want to remind you that this Saturday, that's just three days away, this Saturday, October the 30th, will be our first official fall festival. We're really excited about this. It's going to be from 3 to 6 p.m. in the afternoon. Be sure to come out. Uh, you can, you can um, uh, help with the, the trunk or treat portion, which will go on in the last hour of that. You can uh, enjoy the games and activities. You can, uh, there's other ways you can even volunteer. So if you plan on handing out candy for the trunk and treat portion, which is from 5 to 6 p.m., please park down in our lower parking lot in the last two rows, the two rows closest to Bob Canolti's house or closest to the street, if you will. And uh, uh, if you have any questions about this fall festival, be sure to see Ben. He's been working hard at that. We're really looking forward to it. It's going to be a way for us to connect with our community and, and, and hopefully get some families to come visit us this weekend. So please come join us for the fall festival and, and find ways that you might be able to help out. We also want you to be aware that on Saturday, November 6th, there will be a Korean Appreciation Banquet from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And this is going to be a unique uh, banquet because the ESL class that Mingu teaches is going to hold an Appreciation Banquet for the congregation who allows them to, uh, to, to use the facilities here. And so the, uh, the ESL students are extending their appreciation to the congregation by preparing and sharing a traditional Korean meal on Saturday, November 6th from 11 to 2 if you want to be a part of that, be sure to sign up at the Involvement Center. Um, and uh, same thing for the, oh wait, oh yeah, be sure to sign up at the Involvement Center um, if you'd like to be a part of that meal. Those are our, the announcements we wanted to make sure we mentioned tonight, uh, but we also want to extend our sympathy to Daryl Lussie and his family and the passing of his mother, Shirley Lussie, on October 22nd. A celebration of life is scheduled for November 13th. In lieu of flowers, memorial donations may be made to the Lussey Memorial Fund through Providence Christian Academy. And also, please continue to remember Matt Lane in your prayers. He is still in the hospital, and Carrie has been able to go visit him several times now. Uh, but earlier this week, he developed C. diff and is uh, being treated for that as well. So as he's uh, trying to bounce back from COVID, he's also dealing with C. diff. So keep Matt in your prayers and keep Carrie in your prayers as well. With that, let us go ahead and go to our Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly approach your throne. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you bestow upon us and, and all the ways that you take care of us and, and all the ways you shower us with your love. And Lord, tonight we, we come before you as a family to lift up some people and some situations in prayer. Lord, we are especially mindful of Matt Lane tonight as he continues to, to uh, battle illness and as he continues to be hospitalized. And, and Lord, with all that he's facing, we ask for your blessings on his health. May he be able to uh, uh, overcome the, uh, continue to improve from having COVID. May he also be able to overcome this uh, C. diff situation. And, and may you bless him with health and recovery and healing and be with those medical professionals who are, who are attending to him. And, and Lord, we, we lift him up to you, the great physician, asking for your, your hand of healing to be involved. Be with Carrie as she uh, spent, has to spend so much time away from him as he's in the hospital. And, and as that's a stressful and complicated situation, we ask for your blessings on her as well. And Lord, there are others th that we haven't mentioned in our health update announcements per se, but but that have procedures going on right now that, that have surgeries pending, that, that have tr undergoing treatments, uh, people with various illnesses right now, Lord. And, and uh, as you can read our hearts and our minds, we, we, we know that there are people who, who we're thinking of that are not audibly mentioned right now. But Lord, we, we ask that you be with those individuals who, who we are concerned about and those situations we're concerned about and bring about healing for them. Lord, especially be with the Lussie family right now as they're, they are, have lost a loved one and, and they're dealing with that grief and that sorrow. And we, we ask for your blessings on them during this time and, and uh, as they prepare for her celebration of life. Lord, we, we ask that you be with them. Lord, we have some uh, wonderful uh, opportunities to serve our community approaching. Uh, we are thankful for the, 
the, the progress of the, the coat drive we did this weekend, and we pray that uh, as we still have some efforts that can be done there, that it will be a blessing to our community, and may our fall festival be, a, 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 be blessed and be an opportunity for us to connect with members of our community and uh, extend your love to them through, through our interactions. And Lord, we, we ask and, and pray that you continue to bless our go and do efforts as we uh, finish out this year's uh, activities in that regard. And, and may we finish strong in a way, uh, intentionally trying to uh, serve our community. And, and may we um, continue that effort going into next year. Lord, we thank you for sending your son to die for us, and we thank you for having the biographies of his life to be able to examine because we know that he is the model for how we should live. And as we continue through our studies, Lord, help us, help us to learn more about him, help us to appreciate him more, and help us to strive to be like him more. Lord, we, we love you, and it is through your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, if you will open up to Matthew chapter 4. Actually, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 4, as we uh, continue this study of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. So we we started this last week. I'm going to do a quick review of the points we made last week, and then we'll we'll continue forward and try to finish studying about his his specific temptation in the wilderness this evening. Uh, The temptation accounts, in particular, we're going to be looking at Matthew 4 and Luke 4 as we study this. Uh, I'm going to start in Luke 4. Eventually, we'll make our way to Matthew 4. I'm not going to read all of the text right now. We'll read them as we move along. But last week we started focusing in on the details of Jesus' temptation. The first thing we paid attention to is that he had returned from the Jordan. And that, that indicates that he had uh, this, this uh, the temptation is intricately tied to the baptism. Jesus went to the Jordan, wherever it was. He went to the Jordan and, to be baptized by John. And after that, when he returned from that event, he entered the wilderness. And so we have this this connection between his his baptism and his temptation. And and there's there's this uniqueness in the fact that he goes from this um, spiritually high moment, if you will, where the Father is speaking from heaven on one of these three rare occasions, and he says, this is my beloved Son. And you know, and, and so you have this, this beautiful acknowledgement of, of Jesus doing something uh, important. Jesus, you have this beautiful acknowledgement of Jesus' obedience here. In the very next moment, he's facing one of the most difficult moments of his life. And it's very reflective of how our lives can be, the ups and downs, the roller coaster nature of it, and how even after a spiritual success, we can find ourselves facing off with uh, spiritual difficulties. And so I, I think it's worth acknowledging that Jesus' temptation is closely connected to his baptism. The other thing we pointed out is the location of the, these uh, temptations that are recorded in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, and that location is the wilderness. Uh, we noted that for in, the, in the area of Israel where this would have happened, the wilderness is a little different than ours. It's not wooded forests, it's desert land. Uh, the, the mountain there in the background is the supposed traditional site of where Jesus' temptation occurred. Of course, there's no uh, verifying that. It's just what uh, the signage will tell you if you travel to Israel. And if you looked at a map uh, from the, if you looked at Google Earth at where this location is, you can see it located there on the red dot near the center of the screen. And, and to the left, to the west, is the wilderness and it's desert land. This is the area that Jesus uh, could have been in as he faced off with this temptation. And the fact that it happens in the wilderness is reminiscent of the experience of the Israelites as they're traveling out of Egypt to Israel. And that during that whole Exodus experience, they spent that time wandering through the wilderness. Another connection to that experience of the Israelites is the fact that Jesus was out here in the wilderness for 40 days, and you may recall that the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years. And that connection uh, seems uh, appropriate because Jesus seems to be um, m- making some theological connections with the events of the uh, redemption, salvation experience of Israel. But it's also worth pointing out that both 
Moses and Elijah fasted for 40 days, and their experience is significant in that they are the forerun- they, they, they are two prophesied forerunners of the Messiah in the fact that Elijah uh, was the one who was said to be um, specifically Jesus' forerunner fulfilled in the life of John the Baptist. Uh, he's, the, he's the figure that John the Baptist represents. And then there's also Moses, who declared in Deuteronomy 18 that God will raise up a prophet like me from among you. And there seems to be some connections there as well to identification of the Messiah. And so you have Moses and Elijah, these two figures from these two significant, historic, uh, heroic figures of the Old Testament who are fasting 40 days, and now Jesus is, and you'll also find those two showing up at the transfiguration, which may add significance to it as well. So the 40 days is a unique um, um, detail worth mentioning as we look at these pieces of information. But I also want to highlight two other statements in this verse. The fact that Jesus was led by the Spirit, and he was tempted by the devil. So this is very interesting because the, this little statement, particularly the phrase led by the Spirit, indicates that this whole situation, this whole scenario, was divinely sanctioned. What I mean is that Jesus was intentionally directed to go to this place to endure this experience. He was led by the Spirit. The image Luke is presenting is not one in which Jesus is, as one author said, passively being dragged out by the evil one to endure temptation. No, Luke is clearly indicating that the initiator of the temptation experience was not the devil, but in fact was God. Now that kind of can complicate things for us. Because the fact that he's being led by the Spirit out here into this experience makes us question, the way that I said it can make us question, well, then is God causing or the source of his temptation? So I want to spend a little bit of time with that idea. How do we balance being led by the Spirit to the wilderness where he's going to be tempted? How do we balance being led by the Spirit with the fact that he's actually tempted by the devil? Now, Scripture clearly teaches in James chapter 1 and verse 13 that God tempts no one. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 identifies God as the one who provides the way of escape so that you may be able to endure temptation. So we can confidently say that God is not the source of temptation. We need to remember, though, that there are times when God permits or allows or sanctions a period of testing in order to accomplish his will in the life of someone. And I think it's important to note this is the case for Abraham. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1 says that as an introduction to the sacrifice of, of, Israel, of, uh, of Isaac, it says that, Abraham, that God tested Abraham. God tested Abraham. Abraham. So we have that kind of language in Scripture. You can go to the book of Job. Satan, or, or some, some spiritual being who was playing an adversarial role in this heavenly exchange, criticized Job's righteousness as being achieved only because God was protecting him. So God allowed Satan to test Job's righteousness by first taking away his wealth and then taking away his health. So we see these instances in the Old Testament where, where these individuals go through true tests, spiritual tests. It's interesting because the Greek word translated tempted in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1 is typically translated as tested. In fact, the majority of times this word appears in the Gospels, that 10 out of the 14 times this Greek word appears in the Gospels, it's translated in terms of a test. The only times it is used in reference to temptation are the four times it's used in reference to this story in the Synoptic Gospels. Let me show you what I mean just by using the book of Matthew. 
If you go to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. A very similar statement to, to what we see in Luke chapter 4 and verse 2. But Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The same Greek word is used in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 3, where we're told that Pharisees came up to Jesus and tested him. Same Greek word appears in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 18, where it says, But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test? And then Matthew chapter 22 and verse 35 uses that same Greek word. A lawyer asked Jesus a question to test him. My point is that there is not much difference between a test and a temptation in, in the language at least. So the, the implication of the Holy Spirit's involvement in leading Jesus to the wilderness must be understood as God allowing Jesus to be tested. And this period of testing was going to involve the devil's tempting. So I think we need to look at this statement through the filter of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, which says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. That verse does not indicate that all experiences in life are going to be painless and easy for the follower of God. Instead, that verse says that all experiences in life can be utilized by God for a good purpose. And in the context of Jesus' temptation, we discover that the devil's hostile intention is put to the service of God's deliberate purpose of testing his son. And that was a quote from a, an author, so I can't take too much credit there. So why is it important that I just spent five minutes talking about that? I think it's important for us to recognize the involvement of both the Holy Spirit and the devil for a couple of reasons. First, those details are a way of presenting an accurate theology of God and Satan, led by the Spirit, tempted by the devil. What I mean is that by setting, is that by setting up our understanding of this event as being initiated by the Spirit but carried out by the devil, Matthew and Luke warn against two common theological errors. One is blaming God for temptation. And the other is crediting the devil with power to act independently of God. In other words, these details, led by the Holy Spirit, tempted by the devil, reveal that God is not the source of temptation. That tempting is done by the devil. But it also demonstrates to us that Satan is limited in what he can do. If you journey through Scripture, you'll come across several instances in which Satan has to gain permission from God to do something. Can you think of any examples of that? Job is one. I've already referenced him. But Satan, in Job chapter 1 and verse 2, is constantly having to consult with God to get permission to act. Can you think of another one? Peter. Peter. Satan asked if he could sift Peter. There is a limit to what Satan can do. Now, I'm not trying to minimize his capabilities. I'm just trying to show us God's sovereignty in that fact. And we've already talked about the fact that God is not the source of temptation. See, the led by the Spirit statement is also important because it shows that this event did not happen by accident. This was an intentional, divinely sanctioned experience for Jesus. This would not be the only time Jesus fa faced temptation, but I think these specific temptations were necessary for him to overcome before he began his ministry. And that's what I want to talk about next. Because for me, I always look at the temptations... And I'm always asking this question. What was so tempting about the temptations? I mean, honestly, have, have you ever been tempted to turn stones into bread? You may have wished you could, but, but how, was, how is that a temptation that relates to us? Or, or have you ever been tempted to bow down to Satan and obtain the kingdoms of the world? 
Have you ever even been shown the kingdoms of the world? How, is that, how does that relate to us? And I don't know about you, but I'm not a huge fan of heights. I know James is. And so I've never been tempted to jump off of anything. So how does that relate to us? One author summarized my thoughts about the temptations quite well. He said, Satan asked Jesus to turn a stone into bread, offered him all the kingdoms of the world, and urged him to jump from a high place in order to test God's promise of physical safety. Where is the evil in these requests? The three temptations do not seem evil in themselves, and yet clearly something pivotal happened in the desert. I've always wrestled. Oh, there was my Arkansas. Wrestled with, wait, nope, I will. I've always struggled to understand why these particular temptations were so tempting. And I think there are three ways in particular that we need to look at them. Particularly using this idea of a test. You see, when you think about the three temptations, we need to understand that the temptations were a test of Jesus' humanity. In other words, Jesus was being tested to see if he would allow his divinity to overshadow his humanity. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, it's been referenced a few times lately in roundtable studies and sermons and things like that. But in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, Paul explained what it took for Jesus to become human. He said that although Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. What that passage is saying is that in order for Jesus to be fully human, he had to divest himself of certain divine privileges. He was in the form of God, but had to empty himself of some of that form in order to be born in the likeness of men. Now, that does not mean that Jesus gave up his divinity. It does not mean that he stopped being God. Instead, it means that he emptied himself of those attributes that, have, that would have rendered his human experience less than human. For example, Jesus gave up things like omnipresence, the ability to be in multiple places at once. In other words, he became bound to a single physical location. If Jesus was in Bethlehem, then he couldn't be in Capernaum. And if Jesus was in Galilee, then he couldn't be down in Jerusalem. He was confined to wherever his body was located. Another example of a divine privilege that Jesus would have had to give up is immortality. The ability to live forever. He became a mortal that could and would experience death. If he didn't eat his body would shut down and eventually die of starvation. If he fell from a tall structure, then the laws of gravity would escort his body rather, rather quickly to a meeting with the ground. He was bound to the laws of physics. And I believe these temptations were a test of whether or not Jesus really emptied himself of divine privileges. I like the way one author put it. He pointed out that in the Garden of Eden... Satan was essentially asking Adam and Eve, can you be like God? And they thought to themselves, well, yes, we eat the fruit, we can be like God. But then in the wilderness, Satan was asking Jesus the opposite question. Can you be truly human? Can you submit to those things that these mortals submit to? that make them so weak and pathetic? Can you endure an existence without those uh, uh, privileges that have been yours for eternity? Can you handle being human? And I believe he did this by tempting Jesus toward the good parts of being human without the bad. 
to savor the taste of bread without being subject to the fixed rules of hunger and agriculture, as one author wrote. To confront risk with no real danger, he continued. To enjoy fame and power without the prospect of painful rejection. See, had Jesus failed at any one of these points, the author of Hebrews would not be able to declare in chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, that Jesus partook of flesh and blood like us. Nor would he be able to call Jesus a high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses like he did in chapter 4 and verse 15. Because if Jesus didn't experience life like a human, if he had turned those stones to bread and had skipped over the, 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 the laws of nature to satisfy his hunger, then he wouldn't know what it's like to be a human who can starve. If he leapt off of that temple peak and it allowed angels to catch him, then he couldn't be our sympathizing high priest who knows what it's like to endure life like us because he's not subject to the laws of physics. So I believe the temptations were tempting because Jesus could have given, could have, excuse me, not given up, Jesus could have resorted to those divine privileges he gave up. And in so doing, he would have negated his human experience. But I don't believe that's the only thing that's happening here. While I do believe the temptations are a test of Jesus' humanity, I think they may also be a test of his mission. In other words, Jesus was being tested to see if he would take an easier route to be crowned the King of Kings. You have to remember that Jesus declared that his route to Messiahship necessitated death. He understood that the only way he could fulfill his salvific purpose was through the cross. So these temptations are also a test of whether or not he would seek a shortcut to that goal. We must not forget that when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked God to remove this cup from me in Luke chapter 22 and verse 42. In other words, he asked God for an alternative method to accomplish his will. Of course, we know that Jesus also prayed not my will, but yours be done, signifying his commitment to God's will no matter what. But there is this moment in the Garden of Gethsemane where he's, he's praying for an alternative. And, and the point is that years before Jesus asked for an alternative way to achieve salvation, Satan offered him some. Satan was offering Jesus the chance to be a Messiah that we think we want. Let me explain. In tempting Jesus to turn stones to bread, Satan was tempting Jesus to be an economic leader. Someone who could feed the multitudes. Someone who could have a kingdom where nobody ever goes hungry. You have to remember that one of Jesus' most profound miracles, one of the few miracles that gets mentioned in all four Gospels, was his feeding of 5,000 people. He miraculously converted a couple of fish and a few pieces of bread into a buffet that fed over 5,000 people. And afterwards, if you read John's account of it, what did the people want to do to him? Make him king. Before that even happens, Jesus is being tempted to turn stones into bread. And there may be a, a sense here in which he's being tempted to utilize his divine abilities to bypass a cross and become a king in the vein of, say, Joseph in the Old Testament who stockpiled food and fed people for years. People would come to a king like that. 
A king who can meet your physical needs? That's an intriguing leader, isn't it? What about tempting Jesus to jump off the temple? In that, Satan was tempting Jesus, in my opinion, to be a heroic leader who looms above the temple and is divinely protected by God. See, the purpose of the pinnacle jump is that it would have been a public display of a messianic sign. In fact, one rabbinical tradition uh, says that when the king, when the Messiah reveals himself, he will come and stand on the roof of the temple. And so, by launching himself off of that peak of the temple, by being angelically escorted to the ground, he would demonstrate his spiritual superiority in a way that would make people flock to him. Satan may be offering him a second way to be a people's Messiah without going through the cross. But then you got to think about that third temptation to bow down to the devil and receive all the kingdoms of the world. Maybe in that, Satan was tempting Jesus to be a global leader, one who rules not just over Israel, but over all the kingdoms of the earth. And in this instance, maybe the devil is trying to seduce Jesus with instantaneous power. Not miraculous power, but authority and wealth apart from the cross. As one author said, maybe in short, Satan was tempting Jesus to take the path of least resistance. We'll talk more about whether or not Satan could deliver on that promise in just a moment. But I think the idea is that had Jesus accepted any of these offers salvation would have been compromised. Because as the author of Hebrews points out in chapter 9 and verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there, blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus had to go to the cross for salvation to work. And, the, and, and Jesus, who in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed for an alternative route, may here at the outset of his ministry be tempted with options that wouldn't result in his death. That maybe w- that wouldn't have resulted in the same type of messiahship, but that would have resulted in one that people were looking for. So I believe these temptations were a test of Jesus' mission. And finally, I believe they were a test of Jesus' identity. In other words, Jesus was being tempted to see if he really was the Son of God. I think the devil was trying to determine if Jesus was really who God said he was back at the baptism. See, Jesus was being tested to see if he was the Son of God. Notice how the devil initiated the first two temptations. You can look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 6, or Luke chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 9. And in both uh, accounts, The devil began the the temptation to turn stones into bread and the temptation to uh, jump off of the temple. He initiated both of those temptations by saying, if you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. This is the same title that God had attributed to Jesus when he emerged from his baptism in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17 and Luke chapter 3 and verse 22. So the, the temptations here have an element in which they're targeting Jesus' sonship. Either the devil wants to find out if Jesus really is the Son of God, or the devil wants to cause Jesus to doubt whether or not he is the Son of God, or both. And if this is the case, then I'm going to pull some quotes from some authors. As Son of God, Jesus must learn as Israel had failed to learn, to put first things first. To put spiritual needs above physical needs when he's tempted to turn rocks into bread. And as Son of God, 
Jesus could surely claim with absolute confidence the physical protection which God promises in Psalm chapter 91 for if he, you know, the angels protecting him, that sort of thing. So why not try it by forcing God's hand and thus silencing any lingering doubts about his relationship with God? In other words, Jesus could jump off that temple, the angels would, would protect him, and he could prove to himself or everyone else that he's the Son of God. And finally, as Son of God, Jesus' loyalty was tested. Where it meant renouncing the easy way of allowing the end to justify the means. When he was taken to that place where he could view the kingdoms of the world, the temptation is, where do you stand with God? Is, 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 is God going to provide everything that you expect as a father to a son? Or do you want to go with me, the devil? And I'll give it to you right now. You know, Israel had fallen to this temptation time and time again and had renounced their exclusive loyalty to God for the sake of a political advantage on numerous occasions. Just think about how they pleaded with God for a king instead of letting God be their king. See, there may be a, a sense here in which in all of these temptations, Satan is either challenging whether or not Jesus is really the Son of God for his own benefit, or trying to put doubts in the mind of Jesus so that he questions whether or not he is the Son of God. I don't know which is in play, maybe both, but it does seem to be that there is a sense in which Jesus' identity is, is being challenged and tested here because on at least two of the temptations, the question being posed is if you are the Son of God. So when I look at the temptations, I don't look at them in light of how they would be tempting to me. I've learned to start looking at them at how they would be tempting for Jesus. And I think they would be tempting for Jesus because they're a test of his humanity, they're a test of his mission, and they're a test of his identity. With that little overview being conducted, let's actually break down each temptation for just a moment and ask a few questions about each of them. Let's start with the first temptation that Matthew and Luke both agree on, the temptation to turn stones into bread. Read that with me from Matthew's account real quick. Oh, Matthew chapter 4, verses one through, um, 2 through 4, I'm sorry. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What was the devil tempting Jesus to do? He's tempting Jesus to satisfy a legitimate bodily appetite in an illegitimate way. Now, this is the one temptation, based on those parameters alone, a legitimate bodily appetite with an illegitimate means. This is the one temptation that I think has extraordinary cor correlation for us. Because the ultimate issue is that, in, in, that any context in which people are tempted to give physical needs priority of, over spiritual needs, they venture into sin. I think we can find that relevant in our own lives in a variety of ways. Choosing the physical needs over the spiritual needs. And I want you to notice how Jesus responded to this temptation. When tempted to turn stones into bread, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3 says, And he humbled you, God humbled you, speaking to Israel, and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know. Nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The passage in Deuteronomy refers to, God's, to God 
teaching Israel to depend on his provision. He tested their faith by allowing them to become hungry in the wilderness. And they complained, they grumbled. Some of them even stating their, their, their desire to return to Egypt where things were better, where they had food on a daily basis and it was convenient and easy. And despite their lack of faith, God graciously provided for them, sending them manna, and in the process, teaching them to trust Him. And here in this moment of temptation, Jesus is saying, I, I remember what my, God, what, what, my, what my Father did for Israel when they were in the wilderness, and how He taught them through that experience to trust His provision rather than your own or someone else's. And to put the spiritual needs above the physical. The second temptation was to, to in Matthew's account, was to uh, uh, jump from the temple and be caught. Luke places that as the third temptation. I don't know that there's a lot of relevance to the change in order. There is probably some. But read with me Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 and 7. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now why did, did, would Satan take Jesus to the top of the temple? The term uh, pinnacle refers to the highest point or the or, or extremity of the temple. It could be referring to the pinnacle of the, the temple itself, the, 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 the building that housed the holy place and the most holy place. It could be just referring to the top of that particular structure on the temple mount, which was approximately 180 feet high. However, it could also be referring to the peak of the temple complex as it overlooked the ravine on the east side of Jerusalem, on its southeast corner, on the royal portico, there was a peak that was even higher than the height of that once you drop down into the ravine was a longer drop than it would be from the top of the actual temple structure. And the likely purpose of the pinnacle jump is that would it have been a public display of, of a messianic sign, as I mentioned earlier, with that one rabbinic tradition stating that when the Messiah reveals himself, he will come and stand on the roof of the temple. So it may be that Satan's appealing to some traditional thoughts about the Messiah. But it's interesting because Satan quotes Scripture here. Isn't that scary when you think about it? That our chief opponent knows God's word well enough to quote it. He quotes from Psalm chapter 91, verse 11 and 12. That passage says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So Satan quotes scripture here. But is he accurately portraying it? If you look at Psalm 91, the passage is God's promise to all who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. He's promising safeguarding and protection. And the mistake that the devil makes when he quotes this passage is he confused the psalmist's stumbling statement. Confuse that with Jesus deliberately jumping off. There's a difference between stumbling accidentally that seems to be conveyed in the strike your foot against a stone and deliberately risking your safety. Satan does not accurately portray Psalm 91. That's part of the problem. But that shouldn't be surprising to us because even though he knows God's word, he is routinely identified in Scripture as a liar, the father of lies. He's the king of the... In other words, he can spin it. He can twist it. 
He can manipulate it. He can contextualize it in a way that makes it not fit with its original meaning. Didn't he ultimately do that in the Garden of Eden? There wasn't a written word of God at that point, but there was an oral word of God to Adam and Eve. And that word was to not eat of the tree of, the, of uh, knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat of it, you will die. And when Satan is tempting Eve, he manipulates God's words. And he says, no, you will not die. Satan knows God's word, but Satan also knows how to twist God's word. That's an important distinction to make. But how is this a temptation? Satan, is, or excuse me, how is this a corollary to us when it comes to temptation? We can sometimes be tempted to test God's faithfulness. Satan's tempting Jesus to test God's faithfulness, whether or not he will hold up to this statement in Psalm chapter 91. Sometimes we do the same. Particularly when we're struggling with faith, we'll test God's faithfulness. We'll test God's promises. I'm not assuming anyone in here has done this before, but sometimes people will get to the point where they'll challenge God. If you don't answer this prayer this way, then I'm not going to believe in you anymore. That's the... the uh, I lost my phrase, so never mind. Uh, but that, that's the extreme, the extreme route some people take. If you, if you don't answer this prayer, if you don't do this for me, it reminds me of one character in Scripture who we often don't think is that bad of a guy, but if you read his story, he's kind of awful. And talking about Jacob. Jacob's story begins with him stealing from everybody around him. Then he's on the run from his brother who wants to kill him. He spends the night in, in, a, in a place where he ends up sleeping with his head on a rock. He has a dream from God. God still cares about Jacob despite all of the deceptive activity he engaged in. God gives him a dream. And when Jacob wakes up the next morning, instead of, instead of having a changed life, he says, you know what, I'm going to set up an altar to God. And God, here's the deal. If you take care of me, I'll come back and worship you again one day. It's like the worst one-sided deal in history. God, if you take care of me, if you bless me, then I'll come back here and be faithful to you. We can have that same attitude sometimes towards God. And it may reflect in, well, when God starts blessing my life, that's when I'll start giving. When God starts blessing my life, that's when I'll improve my attendance. When God blesses my life, that's when I'll commit to this responsibility or this opportunity or this ministry or this leadership role or when God does this for me, I'll in turn do this for him. There are ways in which we engage in or that we face off with the same kind of temptation. And finally, there's the temptation to bow down to the devil. Look at that one with me. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Now, did the devil literally take Jesus to the top of a high mountain? Uh, reading from one uh, commentator, the scene is reminiscent of Moses' climbing Mount Nemo and looking over the promised land in every direction. And the word cosmos here, the word for um, let me, uh, the world, 
in this context could indicate the world in a limited sense, as it does elsewhere. And if this is the case, cosmos most likely referred to Palestine alone. But the action of taking Jesus to a very high mountain and showing him all the kingdoms of the world could not have literally occurred, since no mountain in the world offers a view of the entire globe. Nothing in Scripture suggests the devil has the power to alter this situation, so probably some type of visionary experience is in view here. My point is this. We don't know where the devil took him. We don't know how the devil took him. And none of those details really matters. It could be that, that the devil just provided some sort of visual experience of all the kingdoms. It could be just a whole lot of uh, hyperbole used here. We, there could have been some mountain that the devil did take him to that showed him several kingdoms. There could have been a mountain that we don't know about that was high enough to see the whole world. I don't know. But do those details really matter? I think the thing we really need to ask is could the devil actually give Jesus the kingdoms of the world? I think it's important to remember that Satan is identified as the ruler of this world in John chapter 12 and verse 31. The God of this world in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. The prince of the power of the air in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. There are several references in Scripture to Satan's authority, Satan's power, Satan's rulership here. And I think we could all agree that Satan has the ability and the opportunity to operate in kingdoms. So do I think Satan could have given it to him? I'm of the personal belief that, yes, he could have. The other thing that comes to mind is, would this actually be tempting to Jesus to, to bow down to Satan? You have to remember that the devil is trying to seduce Jesus with instant power, instant authority, instant wealth. The Old Testament indicated that the Messiah would reign over all the nations. In passages like Psalm chapter 2 and verse 6, Psalm chapter 72 and Daniel chapter 7. However, this universal rule would only take place after Christ's suffering and death. So in short, as I mentioned earlier, Satan was tempting Jesus to, to take a path of least resistance to accomplish that end with an easier means. And before we assume that this temptation would have no appeal to Jesus, let's not forget that when the cross was imminent, Jesus prayed multiple times for God to find another way, for an alternative route. And though I didn't talk about this on the last temptation, it's worth mentioning again here that when Jesus faced this temptation, he responded by quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13, where it says, It is the Lord your God who you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. So every instance of temptation, Jesus responded with God's word. So I've run through these temptations. There's a lot more that can be said about them, but our time is about up. And there's two things I want you to notice as we kind of wrap up our study of the temptation. And that's what happened at the end of the temptation. The first thing we'll notice if you look particularly at Luke chapter 4 and verse 13 is that the devil departed from him until an opportune time. The devil left until an opportune time. You see, we often ask that question, were these the only temptations Jesus ever faced? We don't have specific temptations outside of these three recorded in Scripture. And Ben brought up a, a point last week when we were st uh, studying this subject. He pointed out the fact that the way Luke um, describes this wilderness experience, it, it seems like Jesus was being tempted every day for those 40 days, not just at the end of those 40 days. I imagine that Jesus was tempted a lot more than this. I believe these three temptations were, were recorded specifically because they relate to the three general ways in which you and I are tempted. The ways in which James talks about the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, 
All three are identified here with the turning stones to bread being lust of the flesh, the uh, bowing down to receive the kingdoms of the world, the lust of the eyes, and then the, the uh, falling from the temple being the pride of life. But here we're told that Satan left until an opportune time. That language seems to indicate that Satan was looking for the next opportunity to attack Jesus. And I'm often, I often have to remind myself, was Satan at work when Peter came up to Jesus and said, no, you will not surely die. And Jesus himself had to say, get behind me, Satan. We will never know all the ways in which Jesus was tempted. Though, but we don't need to know all the ways. But you yourself have experienced a great amount of temptation in your life, and you, and you see how often and how difficult it is to face temptation, how frequently it occurs. Do you think, do you think that if Satan understood who Jesus was, that he would let him off the hook? Do you, do you think that Satan would have gone easier on Jesus than he goes on you? I've often thought of it this way. I grew up loving basketball, and I got to watch it in its heyday. I got the tail end of the Burden Magic years. I got the full spectrum of the Michael Jordan years. I've gotten to watch the Kobe and LeBron years. I've gotten to see the greats since the 80s. Okay, I get it. There's Kareem, there's Wilt, there's these other guys. I get it. But one thing about Jordan and the Bulls, no team ever played them and just said, Michael Jordan's too good, we're not going to guard him, we're going to let him go, and we'll just cover the other guys. He can do his thing, and we'll just take them out of the game. That's not the way they played defense against him. They did everything in their power to slow him down, to reduce his effectiveness. And I've always thought in terms like that, when I think about how Satan must have felt about Jesus, he was going to throw everything he could at him because if he could get Jesus to just mess up once, he wins. If he could just get Jesus to commit one sin, no matter how big or small, he wins. So I'm certain that Jesus likely faced even greater temptation at times than you and I have faced. There's no telling what else was thrown at him over the next few years of his life because if he messed up once, Satan is victorious. I might not know all the ways in which Jesus was tempted. But I know that he knows what it's like to be me. And that tells me a lot. I'm never given an example of Jesus be, being tempted with sexual sin. But that doesn't mean that he may not have been. I'm never given an example of Jesus being tempted with financial malpractice. But that doesn't mean he wasn't. See, I think Satan threw, the, threw everything he had at Jesus. I also think it's interesting that at the close of the temptation, I need to make this point before the bell rings, Matthew tells us the angels came and were ministering to Jesus. Think about this. One of the temptations was to throw himself off of the temple so that angels could, could carry him, angels could tend to him. And that angelic help of, of Psalm 91, which Jesus refused to call for illegitimately, is now appropriately given, as one author has stated. And a similar situation to this will occur in the Garden of Gethsemane as after he completes his time of prayer. You can read about it in Luke chapter 22 and verse 43. And you know what that tells me? That it's quite possible that in the Garden of Gethsemane as he's praying, that he might be dealing with temptations that I'm unaware of, since these angels are ministering to him in like fashion to what they did here at the conclusion of these temptations. With that being said, I'm going to wrap up our, our study Take this away from tonight. Take away the fact that 
from Jesus, we have a strategy for dealing with temptation, particularly his quoting of Scripture. Our familiarity with God's Word should be our first defense. And because Jesus was tempted with all these things and all these uh, ways that connect with 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, we at the very least can say that he is indeed our sympathizing high priest who has been tempted in every respect as we have, yet without sin. That's our ultimate takeaways from the study of the life of Jesus when it comes to the temptation in the wilderness. Let's close with a quick word of prayer. Lord, we are humbled by the fact that Jesus was able to endure temptation without sinning, and we are grateful for that. We are thankful that through his perfect life, salvation was achieved, and through his perfect death and resurrection. Lord, help us to be better at facing temptation and help us to learn from him how to do so. It is through your son's name we pray. Amen.